Cora TV. The world is thinking. Welcome to the Battle of Ideas. First of all, those of you who haven't been officially welcomed at the official welcome. Um, my name is Dolan Cummings. Uh, um, I work at the Institute of Ideas and um, along with a team of others, including um, Cara Blyman and Sarah Boyce, who are in the room, um, I've put together the music sessions for the Battle of Ideas. Um, I'd like to thank the Royal College of Music um, for supporting um, the, the, the Strand, along with the Society for the Promotion of New Music, who have some listening posts just out here, and I'll explain that um, in a bit more detail um, before we finish. Um, the, the opening discussion we're having now, um, each of his iPod, or Great Music for All, is really looking at, at the question of um, whether music is, is universal, or can be universal, or what makes it universal. And I think it's a, it's a question that cuts across perhaps other art forms, but is particularly interesting in, in, in music. Uh, and it's, this is the first time we've really discussed uh, music at, at the, the Institute of Ideas, so um, it's, a, I think, a, a very interesting way into it um, and, and sheds some um, interesting light or perhaps sound um, on all kinds of issues. Um, I've forgotten who it is who is supposed to have said, I like both kinds of music, country and western. Um, <laughs> but I think that's a useful reminder that um, for much of history and much of the world, there hasn't really been much of a, a sense of choice in music. Music has just been part of a, a culture which has been given fairly traditionally. Um, and even with the development of, of art music in, in, in the early modern period, um, it's fairly straightforward. Um, obviously, a huge uh, tangles and, 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 and ebbs and flows of, of who's popular, but the basic idea of what kind of music seems to be um, less problematic than perhaps it is now. And so now, given with, with the, the massive choice that people have, it's possible perhaps um, for twins, um, who, who, who are, uh, t t t um, a pair of twins to develop completely different tastes in music. Um, and I think that's very interesting, perhaps liberating, but doesn't mean that we've lost, lost the kind of the real music, the idea of a proper rooted kind of music. So those are some of the issues. Um, I won't blather on anymore. Um, let me introduce the panel um, who will be discussing the issue. First to speak on my immediate left will be Ivan Hewitt who's a music critic for the Daily Telegraph, also a composer in his own right, a broadcaster, many of you will know from Radio 3, and author of Music Healing the Rift. Um, after Ivan, on, the, the, on my far left, is, is John Webster, who's the Chief Executive of, of Music Managers Forum, which is a trade body for music managers and artists. And he's also a founder of, of the Mercury Music Prize. Um, after John will be Barb Younger, um, a chansonnier and singer, um, her recent CDs include Walking in the Sun and Love Me Tender. Um, and then finally we have Nicholas Kenyon, um, who's the managing director now of the Barbican Centre and was formerly for um, 10 years before that um, the, the director of the BBC Proms. So I think we have a very qualified panel and a wide range as well. But not, I won't pretend it's representative of, of, of music in its entirety. Um, we would need a much bigger table to do, uh, to do justice to that. Um, but in any case, I think we have uh, the, the grounds of a, a good discussion. So each speaker is going to speak for five to seven minutes, and then I'll be perhaps draw any interesting disagreements or tensions, and then I'll, I'll, I'll get you in. I'll, I'll try and bring lots of time for, to hear from you um, and hear what you have to say. Okay, so Ivan, would you like to start off? Yes, I'm going to try this. Does that, does that seem to be working? It does. Fantastic. Um, I'd just like to add one thing to Dolan's very fulsome description of me, which is that I also teach at the World College of Music. I, I ought to mention that as, as they are you know, involved in this event. Now, uh, you'll have seen from the rubric that our, our topic is universals in music. Are they universals? Uh, a, a colossal subject, um, a, a, an important one, and I thought I might just broach it by telling a little story. Uh, some years ago, uh, I went to an event at the Barbican Centre. Uh, this was a celebration of the music of George Ligeti, a great Hungarian composer who at that time was still alive, uh, fortunately no longer with us. And uh, as part of these celebrations, we were treated in the foyer to a concert of music from a bunch of Akka pygmies who come over all the way from Central Africa. They looked somewhat bewildered under the harsh lights of the Barbican. But they performed this marvellous uh, polyphony and, um, to a, a big audience. And we were all utterly entranced by this. It was quite magical. And I, I look back on that event because it seems to be such a perfect illustration of the thesis that music is universal. Because there we were, a bunch of you know, cosmopolitan, middle-class Westerners, apparently 
um, resonating, enjoying, uh, uh, appreciating, let's say, in, you know, in a thoughtful way, this extraordinary music. Um, but I recall it because, in fact, I'm, I'm not sure it does say that um, at all. Uh, rather the reverse, actually. Um, now, if one's thinking of assembling you know, evidence for the idea that music uh, has universals in it, there's plenty to choose from, isn't there? I mean, at, just at the basis of physiology, we all, no matter where we come from, have certain aspects of our bodies that make us share certain musical uh, faculties or traits with others. We all can fall into step with a rhythm, for example, uh, a uniquely human ability. Uh, the same bits of the brain process music uh, across different races and cultures. The same bits of music, the same bits of the brain, in fact, that process language in many cases. So that there's a kind of biological substrate for the idea that we appreciate and make the same kind of music. There's also the evidence that no culture, as far as we know, is without music. No one's yet found a culture that doesn't have a musical practice of, of some kind. And then added to those two things, of course, is the first thing, I, the thing I began with, which is this, this subjective feeling that one encounters when you, when you listen to a music that's not from your culture, that at some level you get it. But there's plenty of evidence the other way, that in fact there's really nothing in the world quite so local as music. You know, and that in fact when we... Uh, when we think we're understanding music from a different culture, um, I suspect that very often what happens, and I, I, this is my skeptical view about the world music explosion, is that it's 20% physiology and 80% fantasy. Um, the, the physiology bit is, I like that rhythm. The fantasy bit is, isn't it marvelous that they're so in tune with their environment? Isn't it marvelous that their music is so wrapped up with their, with their way of life and that it's all, it's all on one organic, that word organic, you know, come, tends to come into play. It's all one organic whole, it's untouched, you know, it hasn't been polluted by, you know, beastly westernization or whatever. It's all rubbish, I think. I think it's, it's just, it's complete fantasy. Now, um, if, we, if you turn to the other side of the question about musical universals, you could say that, that searching for it is a kind of... It, it, if, if one looks at it from the point of view of an aspiration, then the, the, the question changes aspect completely. And uh, to maybe explain what I mean, if I revert back to my first anecdote, the reason that music was there, why was it there? Why were we hearing Aka Pygmy music in the middle of a celebration of the fiercely modernist music of George Ligeti, great Hungarian modernist composer? Well, the reason is that Ligeti was fascinated by Aka Pygmy music, and he derived enormous inspiration from it. Um, but, interestingly, it came to him secondhand. It came to him through the work of an Israeli musicologist called Simha Aram, who'd analyzed this music and re revealed its extraordinary... Um, the extraordinary way it reinvents the notion of polyphony. And this fascinated Ligeti, and it helped to set him off on a whole new train of thought in the last few years of his life. And um, this, uh, I, I remember this event because it, it brings home to me the idea that, that even to speak of universals in music requires a Western Enlightenment, maybe even modernist, perspective. One, the, the very notion that there is this thing called the musical realm, which consists of formal things like rhythm, form, possibly harmony, melody, phrase, period, sentence, cadence, all that stuff, all that stuff that I try to teach over there and the other building just across the road. All these are Western concepts which some people say are, should not be brought to bear on these other musics. And, but just to end with, I'd like to... Um, call on the work of a very distinguished musicologist of Ghanaian origin. His name is Kofi Agau, and he wrote a wonderful book about the music of the Iwi tribe, his own tribe, in fact, in northern Ghana. Well, he, he said in the preface to this book, I would argue not only that listening to African music can be highly rewarding, 
And he says that because one isn't supposed to listen to African music. You know, listening isn't a proper category. It's not a, it's not a legitimate category of approach. You, you're supposed to be in it. You're supposed to participate. He says, I would argue not only that listening to African music can be highly rewarding, but that such listening must form the basis of any serious engagement with that repertoire. Close listening can, I believe, contribute to the empowerment of northern Iwi musicians by bringing to bear on their compositions the same types and standards of scholarly scrutiny practiced on some more canonical repertoires. Now, this is, this is a Ghanaian man uh, speaking. And later on in the same book, he says, it seems to me a tragedy of ethnomusicological research into African music that individual works are reduced to the status of exemplars of larger repertoires and classified as types rather than studied as artistic works in their own right. So there are a whole, a whole battery of Western concepts are, are there brought to bear, aren't they? Can, canon, work of art, individual genius, and so forth. So I'd just like to end with the thought that, that there's no escape from our Western viewpoint, and that's no bad thing. Okay, thanks for that. Bang on time. <laughs> John. Um, morning. Um, in many ways, I was surprised to be in, invited to this because, um, but now having heard Ivan speak, I know why. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because um, I am not a theorist, a theorist. I am opinionated about the record business and what goes on in the world, but I uh, do not uh, embrace the concepts that you are talking about. I, um, I feel music, I suppose, more than anything. I always have. I'm the person who listened to Penny Lane by the Beatles the first time, and someone said, well, what did you think of the brass section? And I went, what brass section? <laughs> I just enjoyed that piece of uh, high notes at the end. Um, and it's why things like Algar's Pomp and Circumstance and Jerusalem are so evocative. Um, it's interesting, I find, that often we start in the blurb and uh, that from, from the classical world. Um, it's a very small part of my life, but uh, I've got a friend who works for iTunes programming their um, playlist that you can buy. I don't know if you know, you can buy 75 tracks at a click of a button and they're subdivided. The number of people who get their iPod and the first thing they do is go, oh, I'll have 75 classical tracks, is extraordinary. <laughs> But then they think, I've got all the classical music I want, I've got those tunes. Um, but it's absolutely true. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's why I think we do start with classical music. Um, we're here to discuss universal music. I think one of the things that is always considered to be a barrier is lyrics and language that we refer to it in. Obviously, English is spoken in many parts, it's spoken in many parts of the world, but do people really listen to lyrics the first time? That's what I would like to honestly question. And when you've ever seen a prepubescent girl singing Britney Spears, hit me baby one more time, and then you actually sit down and think about it, or you listen to the police, people naming the police song Every Breath You Take as one of their favorite love songs, when in fact it is about loss and obsession, or then the archetypal example, um, which I don't know if you were involved with years ago, but when Lou Reed's Perfect Day became the song for comic relief and went to number one, when it's a song about spending a day with heroin, <laughs> which is what it's all about, and it was what he wrote it about. Um, hymns can be very uplifting uh, as a tune, but does anyone really know what a cherubim and a seraphim is these days, or care? Um, and then finally, about lyrics, of maybe something that Barb is going to talk about. I saw a great quote the other day from someone uh, who said, uh, Dylan, oh, I love Dylan, he's a genius. Can't understand a word he's on about, but he's a genius. And that's because it's what it makes you feel, I believe. Um, we're talking, we talk these days about the iPod generation. In many ways, it is just a conveyor of music. Um, I think, Ivan, you said in one of your articles that it's difficult to listen to classical on uh, an iPod. And it is, but it's, listen, it's difficult to listen to any long piece of music. I will not, I don't own an iPod. I don't want to listen to music like that, and I've just chosen that. And if I ever want to listen to Genesis Supper's Ready, which is 22 minutes long, I sit down and listen to it. I do not, I don't want to listen to it like that. But the iPod has made my son's generation, my son is 15, and iTunes freely admitted they sell tracks. They do not sell pieces of music. In, you know, they might sell one track that you want, but at the end of the day, they just sell tracks. They're not interested in selling albums or things like that. Um, 
So maybe you've come to the conclusion that the only ubiquitous form of music is, um, is perhaps instrumental music. If you go back 30 years, I think, to, uh, to a film that uh, was incredibly popular, Aliens Landed from Another World and communicated us, to us by going... Da -na 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 -na. <laughs> Um, and in the end, I suppose it comes down to how I feel and if I like it. Um, the internet is opening up massive opportunities to hear music from all over the world, and I think we just have to enjoy them. Okay, thanks a lot, John. Um, so interesting how everybody comes at this from a different place. Um, I come at it from the point of view of making music, actually, uh, and so my feelings about music are possibly a little bit different, and they're uh, both critical and uncritical accordingly. Uh, in 1991, I was on a plane going to Sudan, and uh, I was going with my then musical partner, Michael Parker, and we had a, a repertoire of little songs that we wrote ourselves, which were about the sort of minutiae of everyday life, for example, going to a laundrette and washing your clothes and so forth. And as we were on this plane, I was thinking to myself, what are people in Sudan going to make of this? And should I run away now? And we got to Sudan, and there we were on this massive stage with an audience of largely non-English speaking people. And I thought, just go for it, just do it, do it. Music communicates. This was song, this was song, this was music and words. And what was fascinating was how much people got. How many people came afterwards to say, this song, oh, it was a song of loss, it was a song from the heart, I felt it. And you go, yeah, well, it was actually, yeah. This song seemed to be about machinery. Go, oh, yes, it was, yeah, oh. And, and th that surprised me, uh, and it was a revelation in many ways. I, at the same, on the same trip, I was sitting one evening, and uh, a woman came up to me, it was a workshop, we'd given a workshop, and she said, uh, uh, she said she, she was uh, a good Muslim and her mother had been in prison for not wearing the veil. There was this long story about to wear or not wear the veil, at the end of which I was in tears. I was thinking about this poor woman's struggle. She said, can I sing you a song? I said, please do, please do. Thinking she was going to sing me some incredible Sudanese piece, she sang Careless Whispers to me. <laughs> she sang me Careless Whispers, a, a song I loathe, and at the end of it, I thought, what a great song. <laughs> what a great song, because it was filled with meaning suddenly. She said, I stood in the courtyard and I listened to my radio at night and I learned songs at night that way. And I learned something from that. Music's magical, it brings people to trance, literally it brings people to trance. You know, you can ignore literature all around the world, you can ignore fine art, you can ignore everything, but music, everybody relates to music. There's an argument, um, Gertz postulates that the oldest part of the brain has in it the capacity for music and dance, that it comes before language, before everything. And you know, we relate to some things and we don't to others. We all resonate to some things and, and not to others because we grow up with the ears we are given in the household we grow up in. If you grow up in a house full of Indian ragas and a conversation about tabla and the linear rhythms of the Indian high art systems of classical music, that is what you'll start with. If you grow up with a sense of Western harmony and consonance and dissonance, that's what you'll grow up with. In 1885, Alexander John Ellis measured the intervals in the scales of musical cultures and said, the musical scale is not one, not natural, not even founded necessarily on the laws of the constitution of musical sound, so very beautifully worked out by Helmholtz, but very diverse, very artificial, and very capricious. I'm a great fan of John Blacking, a man who grew up in um, Canterbury uh, with the Canterbury choral work all around him, was a chorister, great classical musician, went across the world, wound up in South Africa, worked with the vendor and said, how musical is man? People do not need to have any understanding of the laws of music to be musical. And I think that's very interesting when we think about universals in music. Secondly, um, he started a whole way of looking at music which draws its inspiration and relates to what Ivan was saying of, uh, from linguistics of deep and surface structure. So in other words, we can listen to a piece of music the way we stand in front of a piece of art and go, like it, don't like it, get it, don't get it. 
or we can spend hours and hours and hours learning about the system from which that music comes, immerse ourselves in that system, learn the aesthetic of it, understand the aesthetic of it, and be able then to appreciate it in a completely different way. They're not better or worse, they're just different. I was in Malawi, and um, I was sitting with a group of musicians, and we were watching a band play in a hotel. And in the early part of the evening, the hotel band, which is a local group of musicians, will play covers of Bob Marley and the Beatles because it's largely a Western audience. And it's okay. And we wait for them all to go. All the Westerners go to bed. And now the musicians play the music they want to play, which sometimes is Kwasa Kwasa from Zaire. It's a little bit of this, it's a little bit of that. Suddenly, in the middle of all this music, the people I was with started to do this remarkable thing. They started to clap and do this business with standing and posture, and they were completely in concert when they were doing it. I had no idea what they were doing. I said at the end, what was that about? They said, ah, the drummer comes from our village, and he saw that we were here, so he slipped the rhythm of our village in to see if we were listening. <laughs> because in Malawian music, each village has a very, very different little elemental rhythm that you don't hear unless you grow up in that music or spend your entire life immersed in it. So going back to this question here, emotion is what I want to talk about really. Does this Chinese musician in the little um, spiel at the beginning here, does this Chinese musician playing Bach move me? Does he or she bring to Bach something I've not heard before, something surprising? Because surprise is interesting. Is there something in there that takes me somewhere new? That's what I'm interested in. Western popular music's really fascinating. It's gone around the world. You know, you can listen to things that have come from the Beatles. The Beatles are absolutely almost ubiquitous. And I'm sorry to say this, but you go to the most remote places. If there's television, you switch on a television, and suddenly there's something there and you think, that explains why there's suddenly a 4-4 rhythm under the music here, because the popular music of nearly every culture now has a 4-4 rhythm underneath it. The music that just came out of that refugee camp, Tiara Win, what do they call that fabulous um, band that came, that it's all got 4-4 underneath it. That music doesn't have 4-4 under it. If you track it back to its origins, but we're not used to listening to 13-7. We're not used to it. We're not, that's not what we're tuned into. And, and, you know, there's an argument. It's good, there's an argument, it's bad. It's what it is. It moves on. Music's alive. It moves forward. It embraces what's there and it takes what it wants to take. And, you know, we, we fight with that. I think we try to find meaning and value in music. And we do that in context. We do that with surprise. Skill. Skill gives us universality. Saccharin 1940s Disney soundtracks suddenly become fabulous when we listen to that. Virtuosity. Virtuosity speaks to everybody. You don't have to understand Roman music to think, my God, that's brilliant. Balkan brass bands tonguing. You go, how do they do that? That's incredible. There are universal forms, lullabies, wedding songs. We're universally linked by our passions for music, our need to make it, to listen to it, to find meaning and function through it and in it. I think music has the power to heal, hold, bind, enchant, divide, and in those respects, I believe it to be utterly universal. To be human, I think, is to engage with music, and to engage with music is to be alive. I think that's universal. Um, thanks very much. Um, like Ivan, um, I've been associated with a, a, a big red brick building across the road from here, but not the same red brick building. Um, and to sit in the Albert Hall with an audience of 6,000 people listening in the most astonishingly concentrated way to whatever it may be absolutely supports Bob's point that music can create a sense of trance, a sense of shared emotion, and a sense of universality. And yet, when you think about it, those 6,000 people all attending to a Mahler symphony or a Bruckner symphony or a Wagner opera are all hearing it in 6,000 different ways because they are all individuals. And I think the tension between the individual person 
and the shared experience is one of the things that makes music such a powerful thing. Now, I think we're in a profoundly, radically different musical situation to anything that has obtained through history. And it's worth just saying a word about how that has come about. Because if you think about it, as, as little as 150 years ago, everybody's experience of music was simply live music. It was what they heard in the streets, in the fields, in the church, and increasingly in the concert hall. But there was no way of reproducing that, of copying it. It was that experience. And composers, when they wrote music, they wrote on the basis of what they had heard, and they either pushed that forward or they reacted against it and went in a different direction. But there was, if you like, if you think of it, the analogy of a house, it was a single corridor. And you think of Brahms, absolutely challenged by Beethoven's symphonies. And he eventually writes his first symphony, which he thinks of consciously as a development of that tradition, pushing it forward. What changes all that? Well, clearly, over a period of time, recording and broadcasting. And those have been the two greatest influences on our musical culture today. And it's why our experience of music, whether it's the Mercury Prize or singing in Sudan or what Ligeti writes, is fundamentally different from anything that has gone before. Because, you know, why was Ligeti responding to African music rather than to the music he'd heard the day before yesterday because of the phenomenal availability of music via recording and broadcasting. And the more music becomes available, the more disorientated, if you like, our sense of tradition becomes. And I don't think you can say that that is a good or a bad thing. It is simply a fact that making all this music available to us has thrown all the jigsaw pieces up in the air of what people feel is music and feel that they can relate to. And, I suppose, and, and so now we have a situation where instead of this single corridor of development, we have a room, a house, where you can simply go into attics and other rooms and cupboards and uh, cellars and dig out the most extraordinary unrelated varieties of music and respond or not respond to that. And just as everybody, I don't know, reads a newspaper by putting together different bits of it and different pages, and that adds up to your personal experience of a newspaper. So everybody's experience of the, of the musical world is put together by putting together a whole set of perhaps random things that they feel that they can connect with. An underlying, just final thought, underlying this question, is music universal? Are we saying that it is a better thing if music is universal? And are we saying that certain forms of music or certain pieces of music are great because they are universal? I think that's a very, very dubious and dangerous assumption because it's the assumption on which the great sort of classical canon tradition was based and we knew that Beethoven's symphonies were important and we knew that Wagner operas were important and that may not be the case and it may not need to be the case in a world in which all music is equally available to us. Okay, I think there's a lot of good stuff to, to get into there. And before I come to you, uh, maybe just pull out one interesting tension which I think has been in, in the discussion, which is on one level, we've, we're kind of clear that music is universal. I mean, there's the basic biological level that, that you talked about, Ivan. But also, um, I mean, John's point about the fact that we often just feel music rather than, um, than listening in, in a detailed way. But in particular, something you said, Ivan, um, that the idea of listening is, is Western, and I, I mean, I, I take your meaning in that um, sitting in a concert hall, listening to a piece of music, even going to a concert, that's not, that, that suggests music as a particular category of life, so it's not music for religion or music for a particular ceremony or music for a particular kind of work. 
And I'm just interested in, but, but you know, obviously, then the point, the point you make is that just because it's a, a Western thing doesn't mean it can't be applied to, to other cultures. So you can have, uh, it's worth listening to African music. I mean, we've spoken before about this, and you've talked about North Indian classical music um, being analogous with, with Western music. But do you think that there's something particularly important about that experience of listening, which can be universal, which is different from the more basic experience of feeling music? I think it's become more important because it fills the gap left by the vanishing of participation, perhaps. <laughs> it's, it's, it's become the new tradition, you could say. I mean, um, I mean, there was a very interesting period of overlap when the two flourished side by side, and in fact, listening rode piggyback on participation. And it's no, I'm sure it's no accident that that period coincides with the greatest flowering of classical music. Because you know, between 1600 and 1900, you were in, well, certainly towards the end of that period, let's say, when classical music became a middle class thing, you were doing as well as receiving. You know, you, you were able to judge that performance in the console of that piano piece because it was very likely you had it in your piano stool at home and you'd struggle through it. And when you got your one or two orchestral concerts a year, you know, which you, you look forward to in a fever of anticipation, Part of the reason you had such a fever of anticipation is that you'd struggle through it in a four-handed version at home with your friends. I think the, maybe the problem now is that that wonderful period of overlap has, has rather come to an end, and that we, we now find ourselves in a, in a listening culture that's, that's rather bereft because um, as, as the, the participatory era fades into the past, um, I, I think the, the, the texture, the richness of the listening ex experience, I think becomes etiolated, it becomes whittled away, like, like eaten, f I'm afraid to say this, sounds a bit pessimistic, I know, but it sort of gets eaten away from the middle, like by termites, you know, and it, it becomes reduced to, this, to, the, to the narrow circle of, um, oh, I don't know, of kind of maybe daydreams or fantasy or something, and I think it was different when you were doing, it was, uh, because then, the experience spread beyond the moment and it infiltrated into your life. It sent out tendrils into your life. Now, I think the, the, the problem now is that musical experience comes as little atoms, little bursts of this followed by a little burst of that. Uh, with little, uh, and these things don't join up in a coherent way. So I, 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 yeah. I've now lost track of your question, I think. But, but, no, that, that, but anyway, that, it's... Uh, I think that's useful. I mean, I'm going to bring Barb in this, but actually just a parallel has occurred to me. I mean, that sounds, although, Although what, what John said it seemed very different from what, what you were saying, Ivan. Um, that critique of the bittiness, isn't your kind of critique of iPods and the idea of um, that the albums are as a piece of music that ought to be appreciated properly? Or, 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 doesn't that imply something of the same kind of um, seriousness even that characterizes um, um, classical music, that you, you know, to be properly engaged with, 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 with popular music? I mean, that's a difficult term to use, but it implies the same kind of thing. Do you... Nah. Does it matter that your son listens to tracks instead of albums? No, I don't think it does. I think it's just the way that they're uh, that they're growing up and they're just consuming things in a completely different way. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he, he, the same. I mean, when he was thirteen, I started buying an Eminem records because that's what all his mates had and that's what he was meant to be into. And then after a while, I stopped because he wasn't listening to them. And then about a year ago, he suddenly said to me, out of completely out of nowhere, and I had no idea. He said. I think Sgt. Pepper's the best album ever made. And I went, how do you know about that? Uh, and other things, that, things I used to work on at Virgin, I used to say, I said, why are you playing Peter Gabriel big time on his, and he said, we was on the Sky Wrestling. I said, I worked on that record. Would you like to hear the album? And he went, no. And that's, that's what's happening, I think. I do want to take out the participation point, though, because I think that, again, we're talking about, partly talking about classical and you know, in, in the Victorian home, every house had a piano, and they probably were playing the things on the concert stage, but surely, at the same time, lots of people were playing the songs they heard down the pub, which were the songs of the time. And in, in these days, you know, perhaps, again, perhaps more in your world, um, maybe participation is less. There's more electric guitars being sold than any time ever. 
It's, it's very, yes. And even if they only play, as my daughter does, smoke on the water and then puts it down again, mm -hmm. she's happy that she's done that. Um, what it might lead to in the future, I'm not so sure. OK, thanks. And, and Bob, you talked about the Malawi thing, I think, was interesting, because you, you've got a division there between the Western tourists who enjoy listening to the band playing mm -hmm. tunes that they know. But it's almost something, you've got that kind of, um, almost a, a contempt is too loaded a word, but you've got musicians who play for the audience and they kind of bang out the tunes mm -hmm. that they know we're popular. And then they get the stuff that really matters to them, the, the, the stuff they know. I mean, I haven't seen uh, films about jazz bands who, who play weddings and so mm -hmm. on, and then they get to play their music mm -hmm. um, um, to themselves, mm -hmm. basically. But doesn't that imply that there's a, there's a richer engagement with it there than, than the simple, you know, the audience can show up and they can enjoy it and dance and get it to some extent, but they're not really getting the music in the way that musicians would. Does that, does that matter? You... I'm, I'm not quite sure what you're asking me, really. <laughs> um, if you're playing, you're playing, you know, and when you play, it's a job. That's why it's called jobbing musician, you know what I mean? So if your job is to play at a wedding, then your purpose is to get everybody up dancing. Mm. And you employ every skill you have to do that. If your purpose is to play at a concert where you're going to give people a meaningful experience, that's what you attempt to do. So depending on the job, you, you play for the job. The point about the audience going away is the audience have gone. We don't now need to perform the functions of our job for which we're hired. We've got to play for another two hours. We can have a bit of a, we can have a, bit of a jam. Mm. And the jam we're going to have is going to be drawn going back on the music of our villages, which we're going to play with each other. It's a different language, but we speak both languages, because they do, they're bi-musical. They've learned all that popular music, they can play it. They also play the music of their own, of their own um, histories, personal histories. Yeah, and I think you're talking about something really important there, which is music with a social purpose. And that is something that, that we, uh, and I think through the tradition that Ivan was talking about that really started in the 19th century of people attending to concerts as if they were quasi-religious experiences in separated off concert halls, have, have really, are really in danger of losing. But you see, the, the going back to that, that experience actually happens in all of the societies in which you have a, a split between whether you agree that it is, is a right split mm. or not is irrelevant but a, a type of music you called high art which has with it a bunch of aesthetics a learning process that involves mm. conservatoires or a system of giving music from one person to another a set of rules and music which is what used to be called folk music or you know traditional music those two separate things and in all of those societies Iranian, um, North Indian classical, uh, there's loads uh, where you've got that high art music. You have the concert experience because that's what you have. If you go to listen to a rag being played in the Purcell rooms um, or indeed in the Barbican and watch the audience, they're listening and they're doing all that thing with the hands, which is fantastic, which baffles me. Where is that beat? I never know. I, I studied that stuff. I have no idea where that beat comes where you turn your hand over. It's mesmerizing. But the point I'm making is that there are quite a lot of high art musics that have a long tradition and a, and a listening. Um, they're having the same debate that we're having here, is my point. The debate we're having is not a Western debate. And the, criti the critical listening element is not just a Western phenomenon. That's the point I'm trying to make. Uh, well, Nick, can I just push you on that? I want to come in too. But isn't there, in some sense, I know this is a terrible thing to say, but isn't it better um, to have this, not necessarily the higher, but the, the, that experience of, of actual pure musicality, even if you see it as being the Malawi musicians, which is, you know, it's, it's not about Western classical music. There's something that if you're passionate about music and you, and you really want to listen to it and engage, and you want other people to, to engage with it on that level too, isn't there, I mean, aren't you kind of evangelical in some sense that you want to get people listening to music in a more profound way than just wallpaper or, or, or dance music or? I, I'm totally evangelical about, about getting people to listen to music, but you cannot dictate to them what level they listen on, mm -hmm. or what degree of understanding they need to have in order to listen. It's like this ridiculous debate that erupted during the summer about applause between movements in symphonies, and uh, people were clapping between movements because they were ignorant about how uh, the great structure of a symphony and so on, and forgetting that, you know, in Mozart's day, people actually clapped during the music, let alone <laughs> between the movements. And I think what I mean about the social function of music is that because 
because society has changed so radically, I mean, the oldest example of all is church music mm. and liturgical music, and that has now been taken out of uh, ecclesiastical situations and actually survives rather well in the concert hall. But there are lots of the sort of musics that you describe, whether it's wedding music mm. or pub music or whatever, that simply wouldn't survive that transformation. But, but can I, why, did, why did it stop? Why did clapping stop, and why did those... When did, when did well, that I think that, uh, yeah, it's very, it is very interesting that it is to do with the sanctification of the concert ritual, mm. which I think you date back to about the th uh, third quarter of the 19th century, no, no. the establishment of the Royal Philharmonic Society and, and a sort of aura around mm. the classical tradition, which it, simply, it really didn't have, have mm. before. Mm. There's that wonderful moment where there's a changeover where there was a point where aristocrats who basically funded this yeah. were allowed to carry on talking. Yes. <laughs> but then they came a point because yeah. they pay for it. But then suddenly, <laughs> and it's very mysterious, there came a point where suddenly they were frozen out by all the middle class people around them, even though they were the social inferiors. And it's like the music took over. Mm -hmm. it's, a one, it's an extraordinary thing. Mm -hmm. About what, 18, 1830s or something? I'm dying to ask John something there mm -hmm. from, what you, from what you said, because you're putting across a, a if I understand it right, a sort of anything goes, take it or leave it. Pretty you much, can respond yeah. to it, yeah. yeah. But, but in creating the Mercury Music Prize, mm. you have brought a really a sense of sophisticated discrimination to that whole area of music making. <laughs> and, and what is the music, Mercury Music Prize? It's not a real value judgment about which of this stuff is any good and isn't. Yeah, but I came to it from a, from a sales perspective. I mean, that's where... <laughs> I'll be perfectly honest about it. You know, I was working at Virgin Records in the 80s, and I started buying books again, novelist, because the British Book Council, someone, rang a campaign saying, these are the best 20 young novelists in Britain, and these are their new books. And I started buying books. And, and it, 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 it was great that I got back into reading books. So, to be frank, I mean and I have said this publicly, the Brit Awards at the time were so, and I use this word very advisedly, corrupt, yeah. that, that I just wanted something that was completely independent. And people criticise it and they go mad about it, and I go, it's, you're talking about music. It's great. That's all that matters. That, that whenever the shortlist gets an ad, 12, all the broadsheets go, oh, this is wrong, why did they miss it? That's what, all that matters, that people talk about music, get exposed to new music, because, so, I mean, we are living in a world where, you know, I just talked about being exposed to new music, but there are, you know, the, the BBC particularly is pretty narrow at times in what it exposes, or, and the commercial stations are just nowhere in you know, so people want to be pointed to music. And unfortunately, the other thing that's happened, of course, is that, well, I used to run record shops. People used to come in on Saturday morning and I'd just go, buy that. And they'd go, fine, and buy it. And I knew <laughs> what they wanted. Those, those days have gone. So they need recommendations. I think people want to be pointed in the direction of TNR, knowing or what they're called. And when they see reviews, they want to be recommended things. And they want to be exposed to things. The stuff's all out there on the internet, but people mm. perhaps of my generation, they're not like my son who clicks from so-and-so to so-and-so on MySpace and keeps, I go, why are you playing that? Oh, I followed someone's link. But people, perhaps at <laughs> my age, haven't got to that yet. They still like to be pointed, and that's why it was created. Okay, I'm going to come to the audience shortly, but uh, Barbara wants to... Uh, just to, to go back just for a second to participation, because mm. I think you painted a quite gloomy view, actually, of, of participation. And there's a, there are a couple of things that I came across, uh, which I'm sure people in the audience might know about, but amateur musicians in Milton Keynes was a study that was done by some sociologist, quite famous sociologist, about 20 years ago, and it was very, very interesting. There was a huge percentage of people playing in amateur situations. These were choirs, these were brass bands, these were all kinds of things which aren't just picking up a guitar, which, by the way, I think is a really valid point, the sale of guitars and kids playing guitar. There's a lot of that. But actually, choirs, workshops, a lot of the time I'm asked to give workshops when I go and play in places. And it's extraordinary, the number of people who take part in the making of music at all kinds of levels. And I, I'm pretty sure that if you asked a, a gathering of people, um, I'm, I'm slightly hesitant in case I'm proved wrong, but how many people, you know, sing, for example, at your yoga class, do music somewhere, play at home, takes part in some kind of music. Lots of people do. 
I think participation isn't undergoing um, a decrease. I think actually it's sort of motoring along quite well and maybe going very well indeed because I think people actually want to participate in music because they know that it gives them something. And I, and I think that's quite interesting. Yeah. I'd just like to pick up on your other point about the fact that there are other classical traditions. And um, on a personal level, because I know I've, I'm, I must be coming across as a great sort of sourpuss of the gathering, but, uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, no. but one of the... One of the reasons I like going to um, two concerts of other sorts of classical music, even though I don't understand them, is that there are often they, they give you a lesson in, in a kind of different kind of civility, in, in a way of you, you have to learn as you sit there how to behave amongst this gathering of people, um, and that requires a certain tolerance on their part because you, you probably won't get it right to begin with, um, but it also. Um, it also enlarges your idea of what it, what it might be to respond to music. I know exactly what you mean when you refer to these wonderful, very poetic hand gestures you see, where it's as if the, the audiences are, at, these, at Hindustani music, are somehow tracing the melodic outline with a hand like that. And it helps you to hear the music, I think. When you, and then you hear this, this collective sigh goes around the room when there's a particularly good riff or, you know, a kind of, well, you know when, when the, when the, when the sitar soars up to a particularly high note and does a tremble at the top, you know, and everybody goes into a little ecstasy. And that's a marvellous thing. But I think it's the wrong thing to draw the conclusion from that, that, that um, a symphonic concert should be the same. You know, it's, it's very odd. I, I, I always think this... Um, um, this is one of the things that shows up that, that I often feel we live in a rather fake pluralism rather than a real one. And the, and the thing that shows up to be fake is that we're all, we're all supposed to march to the same tune. You know, we're, it, we're taught that the formality of a symphony concert is a really bad thing and that we should loosen it up. But why, I say, why not horses for courses? You know, you behave in a different way to a sitar recital or, or a pop gig than you do in a symphony concert, and that's just fine. And you move from one space to another, and you learn the, 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 how to be civil in each space, and that's part of being a civilized person. Okay, I'm um, speaking of participation and civilized people. Um, <laughs> let's come to the audience. I'll, I'll take a, a few points. You don't have to just ask a question, you can make points as well, um, and then I'll get the panel to respond, and hopefully we'll take um, a couple of rounds. Um, so, <laughs> uh, here, well, here, here, and here. We'll start in the middle. Yeah, uh, cards on the table. I'm afraid the, uh, uh, the, the central issue here, as I see it, it seems to have been evaded almost uh, uh, around the table. Um, it's th this question of universality, and um, th I'll, I'll introduce it by a fragment of a sentence from the philosopher Stanley Cavell. It's the only thing of Cavell's I remember. Music, comma, the newest of the great arts, comma, and the rest of the sentence I forget, but that has, that has stayed with me, you know, this idea that uh, um, music came late on the scene in, in European culture, just as science came late on the scene, because both were, had to be uh, constructed from whole cloth. There was, there was no precedent. There, were no, there, were no, there was no ancient art or, or tradition in Greece or anywhere else to draw on. They had to create it. There was no music. Music was still primitive in the Renaissance and science was still primitive in the Renaissance. It took all that time to create it because it was new. Uh, uh, and we have had the, the world's first and only great art music and it's over. That's, that's, the, that's the other thing. It, it, in 1908, the Schoenberg's second string quartet, that was it. That was, it, was, it, you know, it, was, it disintegrated <laughs> at that point. You know, uh, uh, so, uh, 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 and that's the predicament we're really dealing with here. We're waiting for the next uh, uh, civilization somewhere, you know, sometime, to, to draw on that. Uh, and, uh, Don't uh, respond just yet. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to have I know, but we'll bear that in mind. Yes, we'll bear that. This is really a point rather than a question. Um, I think it's interesting that people always talk about gatekeeping in the context of classical music. And that discussion reminds me of um, many years ago, I spent the summer in the province of Salerno outside of Naples with a bunch of Tamuriata uh, performers. It's a you know, pagan ritual involving a drum and people dance in squares and play instruments and stuff. And you know, it's a very, very old tradition and there are older people who know all the songs.
songs and so on. But I spent the entire summer watching these old people complain about the young people who didn't seem to understand that they weren't supposed to move their hips while they were dancing and they weren't supposed to get too close to each other because it was all elusive of sex but not, you know, no touching involved. Um, and then, of course, you go to Ronnie Scott's and there are those little notes on the tables urging you to complain about your neighbours if they're being too noisy during the jazz singing or the jazz performance. Um, so I, I think that probably many musical traditions have their gatekeepers. Um, and I think that, that the tension there is quite interesting. Um, and I think that uh, the, the phenomenon that I'm obser observing through what I'm doing, which is um, a classical music website that I'm launching soon, is, is the issue of classical music on the internet um, and the way in which the internet is giving a lot of people a way into um, a musical form that has actually quite a lot of gatekeepers um, who are quite happy to make their views known in, in magazines like Gramophone. And I was reminded of that when I read a piece by Philip Kennicott a few months ago about the iPod filing system and how incomprehensible it is for classical music and how terrible this was because it showed that people in, in on, you know, that no one cares about classical music and classifying it correctly and adequately. But of course it fit by saying, well, that just shows the subtlety and sophistication of classical music itself, which can't be classified. Um, so, <laughs> you know, um, anyway, so it's just an observation, but I would still make the general point that there are gatekeepers around lots of musical traditions, and I think that, um, that a availability is also giving people a way into um, musical traditions that they wouldn't have had access to otherwise, um, which is good. Okay, thanks for that. There's a man in the front, and can I just see hands of other people who want to come in? Okay, uh, I think we have sort of nice consensus up to a point, <laughs> but uh, once you get past the, the sort of wow factor, does the music work for you? I always think the consensus sort of breaks down if you try and have any discussion about what makes music good in some sort of objective terms. You know, if you, there's always the argument, you know, punk's no good because they can't play their instruments or things like that. And I think each of the different types of music, I can only really speak about Western music, sort of values a different thing. So if you're dealing with the classics, it's often, you know, is it structurally complex? How does it fit in with the tradition? There's an element of, is it virtuosic, which also is around in jazz. Um, if you're dealing with sort of rock music, other sort of popular music, there's sort of notions around authenticity or attitude or a, a whole lot of different things. And if you're trying to judge, you know, if you say, what is the criterion that makes music good? I don't think you can have a universal one. It just doesn't work across all the different types of music other than this makes me good, feel good. I don't like the sound of that. So I just wondered if you had comments on that. Okay, yes. there's a the woman at the back. Yeah. And then um, over here, and then Tiffany, and we'll come back to the audience. Yeah. And then go ahead. I think, is this working? Mm. Um, I think it would be very helpful if we were perhaps, I would say, honest about the fact that for some of us, the actual analysis and making of music and exploring of music, that music itself is a passion for us that we regard it as almost you know, a way of life in all sorts of ways, whether we perform or talk about it or analyze it. Um, but for so many people, uh, it's not that. It's an accompaniment to their life or it's an expression of their life. And uh, that for that reason, I'm always fascinated to go back to genuine folk music because I always contrast that in my mind, that somebody has a heart-moving experience or a tragic experience, and the only way that they can give expression to that is by writing a song. Whereas somebody may say, I, I, I wish to pursue music as a profession, I love it, and therefore I'm going to become educated, and therefore I'm going to be influenced by all my teachers, um, or I'm going to argue with them, but you, get, you go down a different path. And I think that if we recognize that fact, it's quite helpful. It's not being snobbish, it's being honest about the fact that, say, Ivan, I was very interested in a lot of it. The, I don't think you're a sourpuss at all. I, I don't think it's that. I think it's that you are absolutely fascinated with an, analyzing music and contextualizing it and all those sorts of things, whereas somebody else is not. Actually, your neighbor more or less said that. Not, not interested in the brass section, just 
<laughs> absolutely responded. Uh, what's the word? How I feel about it. It's just simple, emotionally. It, it, there's something spontaneous about yeah. it. And in fact, you even feel this endless analysis. It's tiresome. It's like we sit in a, in a concert, we're enjoying a piece of music. To try and read the program notes is to destroy all the fun. Um, I mean, do you have, and I think one reason where we've gone off the track in classical music, I mean, I have to confess, I'm a professional musician and I passionately love music. But I think, as a child of the 60s, I don't have a rosy view of the 60s at all. I had always written songs. I couldn't study composition because it was a crime to write a tune, literally. Um, squeaky gate, fine, tunes, cop out. So I didn't study composition. I wish I had. Um, and there was a very definite feeling of raising two fingers to the audience and sort of saying, well, Paul Saps, you don't understand what we're doing, you know. We are so complex, we are so clever. And I think the outcome of that uh, is that people became alienated. And I think we're now desperately trying to re-establish those, those barriers, and those bridges rather, those bridges, and overcome the barriers. And I think we should do that. Um, I think I've said enough. Okay, <laughs> thanks. There's, there's a guy over here, then Tiffany Jenkins at the front, then the panel, and then I'll come back out for another round. Um, I'd like to follow up on uh, this gentleman's point um, about universal criterion and whether they exist or not. And I think that uh, most of the examples that we sort of heard have actually demonstrated that there aren't universal criterion. I mean, I'm thinking of the clapping between movements and how that was actually tied to uh, time and place. Um, and also um, the example that Barb gave about, um, I think it was a careless whisper, and how a song can be completely transformed in terms of whether it's good and bad because of time and place. And I would say that the useful thing is not to actually think about whether there are universal criteria, um, universal criteria, but to emphasize the particularity of music, because that's what actually helps us to all understand it. I mean, I, I'm a composer, and one of the things that I find most frustrating is that people come up to me after a performance of my piece, and they say, well, what does it mean? And they basically want me to somehow conform to their um, viewpoint on music in terms of how it conveys emotion, for example. I don't happen to think that my music conveys emotion in the kind of uh, subjective romantic sense that people often expect. Um, and it, it creates a barrier between me and uh, the kind of communication that I'm trying to have with my listeners. Thanks. Um, and then Tiffany at the front, and then I'll have a keen to come back. I wanted to come back to something that Nicholas said as a throwaway comment in his introductory remarks, and that is that there's a potential for kind of um, endorsing universalism as being something dangerous, and I think you're getting to the idea of value judgments being potentially problematic. One thing that I think is really interesting about today is that the only thing you ever hear, it's a slight crass generalization, but I'll make it anyway, is that diversity is a good thing, it's all subjective, and that is absolutely monolithic now. It's one thing for people to talk about audiences and individuals picking and mixing, but when you get down to something like cultural institutions, whether it's the Barbican or the Royal College of Art, do they not have a responsibility to make value judgments, both to their uh, students, but also to the audience? I'm not the most knowledgeable person about music, so I do look to my um, people who know a little bit more to guide me, and I can always turn it off. I wonder if they have a responsibility, and in fact, if they're just being a little bit too defensive now in that responsibility today. Okay. Nick, do you want to respond to that, or anything else, actually? I really want to respond to the first yeah, point, because <laughs> it's, it's such utter bollocks. Yeah. <laughs> go, 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 Nick, go. The idea that music only became sophisticated in the 18th century and died in 1911 is a profoundly, profoundly old-fashioned idea which predates the experience of music that I was trying to talk about, where so much is now available to us, but we can recognize that plain song and peritin and, and medieval music of all kinds is just as sophisticated as anything that Mozart and Beethoven and Brahms wrote. That that's my view on that. Um, the question that I was asking John about the Mercury Music Prize and whether it's declaring taste is very relevant to your point and also to this point about gatekeepers, which I think is an absolute responsibility on anybody who runs a cultural institution because we are making choices based on taste the whole time. And I think the responsibility is to be uh, wider than your own 
personal taste, um, to reflect what the audience's current view from the, the, that point of view is, and not, which I think has been a, a failing in the past, to have a totally top-down idea of declaring your taste and expecting people to move with it, but to actually respond to how the audience is changing and is moving. And that's always a tricky balance. Yeah, Ivan, what's your take on that? Well, this, this, I, I, I slightly object to the word gatekeeper, I guess. It, it suggests that um, marching up and down on, along the borderline between different genres of music and different genres within music are these kind of cultural policemen, you know, who say, no, you can't cross from there to there. It's funny how the idea of distinctions between things is always cast in a bad light. It's curious. I mean, I would just say, isn't it interesting that we have, in cultural life, all these interesting distinctions? between this genre, between that genre, between this culture, between that one, between things which we think are excellent, things which are merely good of their kind, and other things which are mediocre. And it's, these, it's the existence of, of ways of distinguishing between, between things that, that allows you to, to create value in cultural life. And when, when they start to get totally eroded, then I think, you know, when, when we all become deprived of our, of our pointers and our, our you know, our, our compass, as it were, our, our aesthetic compass, then I, I think the, you know, the, the kind of roots, the kind of substance of our pleasure in culture starts, starts, to, di starts to diminish. But aren't we, all, aren't we all saying, I didn't think that was quite what you meant about gatekeepers, aren't we all saying that there are value judgments to be made in whatever genre we're talking about? That's my, that's, uh, that's my own. Yes, uh, uh, certainly there are. I mean, I'm, I wouldn't like to imagine. It seems to me that if, when you when you think of of universals of music, if if there could be such a thing, I I the only way I can make any sort of sense of this is to call on the this idea of family resemblances. You know that you have a whole lot of musical practices where A has maybe something in common with B, and B has something in common with C, and C is connected to D, but to, but there is no one overriding conception which wraps A, B, C, and D all up in one thing. And that, and that maybe, uh, I think perhaps one of the problems with classical music that, that the gentleman here alluded to, the fact that it basically starved itself of oxygen and died, according to one view, you know, in, in the early years of the previous century, is that it made itself so pure, it defined itself so exactly, that it cut off its own oxygen supply and it, 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 it annulled all its links with other forms of music. And, and so one can go too far the other way, too. Um, I, th I think there, there are so many things that we, we you know, we, we don't have a lot of time here. And we're bunching a lot of stuff together that we actually need to unpick a little bit. There's a difference between the process of composing and the process of performing. There's a difference between those processes and the process of listening. There's a difference between all of those things that are very, very important and fundamental if we start talking about all the things. But if we go back to the generalities that we might draw on, that we could say, well, what gives music meaning? Because music in itself doesn't have any meaning. It is patterned sound. Mm. It's patterned sound in all the various communities, and we impose meaning upon it. It doesn't have any. It, it doesn't start with any. We give that to it. So then we have to go, well, OK, what meanings are we going to give value to? And if we start to look at where we might find those things, we do start to find some things that we all agree on. Context, for example, virtuosity. We all know when something moves us, emotion. We all know when something's skilled. There are little things that give us clues. We all sit in a concert. It doesn't matter what it's a concert of. You sat in a theatre and gone, they are not giving it their all. You know it. We all know it. We all have the language of understanding of the things that we go to see to some level, or we wouldn't be there in the first place. And we have to trust that a little bit, all of us. And then there are degrees of further understanding that allow us to make comments about Schoenberg that maybe we can disagree on in a deeper way, or maybe we're not. But the point is that there are some things that we do all recognise, and we recognise them in every kind of music, actually. We can tell if a bunch of people are playing and they don't give a damn. And we can tell if they're playing with their whole hearts. 
And that's something we share, and we share that because we're human. The universality in here is the human bit. It's the Gertz bit. It's the back of the brain. It's the responding bit. And all of the other stuff, we lay on it, and we can agree and disagree about those bits, but we all get that first bit, it seems to me. Okay. Um, John, uh, funny enough, what do you think about this question about responsibility? Because in the, the Mercury Prize, it says that kind of gatekeeper. But does the Mercury Prize have a responsibility to, to promote good music, to, 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 to introduce people who are looking for what album should I buy to something that's really good? Or is it more cynical than that? A responsibility? No, I don't think it has. It's just 12 <laughs> music critics talking about music and deciding what, what they feel is the album of the year. It's as simple as that. The ones that have slipped through the cracks are stunning, quite frankly. The ones that have won sometimes are stunning. Some have disappeared without trace, some have become classics. But I don't think... It's a, that's a responsibility of any critic, though, isn't it? You know, talking about something. Because, you know, you can wake up in the morning and have had a bad day and think, oh, I'm going to diss the new Eagles album just because I hate the Eagles. And even if you actually listen to it, it's, it's really, really good. I have some. I'm not talking about the New Eagles album. <laughs> I, I do want to pick up on your point about time and place and everything, because I think that the judgments do change. I mean, drastically. I mean, the classic example, if you go back, was that when ABBA burst on the scene, at the time it was A, long-haired rock music, and B, punk was just coming through, and ABBA were just dissed completely. Mm. Now people go, have you heard those harmonies? Have you heard those bass lines, the way that they're constructed? And they've come right back into sort of, um, you know, I, I loved Take a Chance on Me by ABBA at the time. I didn't know why, I just loved it. But uh, if you actually, people now go and say, oh yeah, that's because blah, blah, blah. I just loved it. But people, um, rock musicians now come back and say, oh, the production's fantastic and X, Y and Z. But producers always knew that the production was fantastic. Mm. You know, different people respond to different things yeah. differently depending on what their, what their um, association is. That gatekeeping point was very interesting because a lot of traditions evolve because of that tension between gatekeeping and the people who come to the gatekeepers. Irish dance is a really interesting example of that because Irish dance has been transformed by river dance because people <laughs> use their arms. Irish dance didn't have any arm movement and then there was the whole thing about letting the arms go, uh, which whether we like it or not, Michael Flatley <laughs> had a hand in. He challenged the tradition. He did exactly what your young people did in, in, um, in Italy when they came and started to move their hips. He challenged the tradition. People at Ronnie Scott's talking, knuckle them. <laughs> <laughs> See, but, but, that, but surely that, you know, I manage an artist, um, a singer-songwriter, and he often at gigs just will just go, why are you talking? Why have you come? If you've come, why have you... If, you've, if you don't want to listen to me, go. Take your money and go. But shut up. You know, and it's, I think that's the same in all genres of music. Why do people go to gigs? Okay. But at the same... And I just want to also say about the classical thing, you know, when people talk about the quietness, huge amounts of people go to fireworks and orchestras, don't they? It's a social event. I don't believe they necessarily, to them, the cannons and all the rest of it, as long as they've got their hamper and their bottle of wine, they're happy. <laughs> it's a different thing. Yeah. In What's the same that way that festivals have become like that as well, rock festivals, they, you know, in the past few years have become, ex well, no, they're not rock, they're right across the board, but they've come in the same thing. It's a social event thing. Okay, I'm going to come to the audience um, for 10 minutes before we, we, we come to final comments. I just wanted to, to pull something out. I mean, the, funnily enough, this Ronnie Scott thing and the concerts, you'd never have thought that but both Barb and John perhaps are kind of closet arch modernists who've got this <laughs> idea. Um, what? It's, it's, it's funny because there's a term... I mean, if I can vulgarise your thesis, Ivan, you've got this time when, when you know, traditionally music has a particular function and to, do with, with, to do with religion often or to do with cultures and traditional um, rites and so forth. Um, and it starts to take off a, a life of its own when people say there's something you can actually listen to and perform on its own. And for you, that stays alive as long as people are involved in it. But it becomes sterile when it becomes purely um, audience. It was, uh, funnily enough, you used the term, um, uh, Nicholas, that it, it was treated as a religion, which is almost like a, re a return to function, but much less popular than, than religion had been, um, if, if popular is the right word, but involving many fewer people. But I think there's something interesting. There's a, there's a kind of journey there of a liberation which seems to be very good because it's about, well, we care about music and it's not 
just the context. But then it goes too far, it tips over. I mean, a funny thing happened that the, we, we have a, a monthly Culture Wars forum. Um, Culture Wars is the website that I had at the IOI. We discussed poetry um, um, last month, and, and there was a tension between those people who thought poetry should be read um, and those who thought it should be read out. Um, and you know, one guy who's an English teacher took it to quite an extreme when he was saying Shakespeare shouldn't be performed. You should sit and you should read Shakespeare, and, and then you understand the poetry properly. Um, and you know, maybe you can go and see a performance if you've studied it, but there's not really no, that's not what it's about. And you know, and pushed him and say, well, what do you think about musical scores then? Should you just sit and read a musical score? He said, well, yeah, I suppose so. Um, and so obviously, we, that, that you can see the, the trajectory there. Like, you know, starting the thing, we want to take it seriously, and that's a good thing. And then something happens, and it, it's not being um, alive. So that seems to be a tension which is very much here. But you know, is, is, there, is there something universal about the aspirations still? And it's, it's not exclusive to Western classical music, but you see it even when Rob's talking about Malawian musicians, that idea of wanting to value the music for itself, but without it tipping off the end into a kind of abyss. Um, anyway, there were, there were a few hands. There's a, there's a man in the middle here, <laughs> and then a woman behind him. I mean, I think that everything the panel has said, from all their very different standpoints, um, absolutely confirms the instinct that uh, music is universal, it is a matter of, of nature, not nurture, um, and it seems to be unarguable. But the question then arises, of course, as to whether that follows from that that everyone is an expert in music. <laughs> and, and I think that's where um, this debate hasn't really focused. I don't think the word education has arisen at all today. Um, Music is something which um, people improve at vastly, whether it's as performers or as, uh, as, as um, theorists or as listeners, by education. And um, I think that one of the difficulties is that people, people uh, improve in that way at very different rates. Uh, some people uh, become um, absolutely obsessed with music and become magnificent musicians through education, but an awful lot of people, uh, it is no more than that first visceral experience. And I think one, one, ha one, one has to recognize this and say that whilst music is universal in, 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 in the nature sense, uh, there is a very great deal of difference in um, abilities and instinct and wish to uh, deepen that understanding. And that what, 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 what we ought to be doing is, educationally is trying to encourage as many people as possible, but that will never be 100%, uh, to, 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 to increase their understanding of music. Thanks for that. The last session today is on, on education, but I think it's useful to bring it at this stage. The woman behind there and then uh, Anka in front. Oh, while well, you've got it, yeah. You first and then. Um. I'd be interested to know what the panel actually mean when they're saying the word universal. <laughs> it, it, it's again a bit confusing, because on, on the one hand, there's this idea that the music itself is universal, and then there's the idea that because music is widely available, it's therefore universal, which, which begs the question, therefore music hasn't always been universal, because it's only widely yeah. available now. Um, but I just wonder whether it's something that Barb seems to, hint, seems to hint at, that music is universal in the sense that it's human beings that produce and listen to music, and therefore it's universal. And then the other point I'd like to make is that it, it seems that even though participation is a good thing in musical terms, I think we've got to the point today where music is being used as an instrument um, for other things. And I think we need to be careful that music is used in order to, as, as, a, as a, an instrument of social policy in order to include people. And I think we have to be careful that, that that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about participation. OK, thanks. Yeah. Um, I'd like to perhaps uh, introduce the concept or, or voice my own concept of music as a somewhat bipartite process and that it is universal because I think at the moment we've, we focus on a division between the music makers and the music takers and I would say that music is both of those put together um, and that what's universal about it is that we do all participate in it in our response to it, be that clapping during Marla, be that chatting at Ronnie's, um, be that tapping our feet, be that anything. And in that sense, I agree with a lot of what uh, Barb has said, but one particular comment I would disagree with, and that is that uh, we can all tell when someone's not absolutely giving it their all, a musician is not giving it their all. I'm sure there are a number of musicians here that uh, will have been to a concert they were perhaps not uh, absolutely tiddly top happy with. Um, 
We've all had one of those. Um, and somebody comes up to you in the audience after and says, that was absolutely fabulous. I absolutely loved it. You've made my evening. And you know, part of being a musician is learning to accept those comments, of course, mm -hmm. and realizing that those people, that is their participation to the music. It doesn't make music sort of any less valid because you perhaps felt that you did a bad job and the fact that they have loved it is their music taking and I think um, there needs to be less of a distinction between music making and music taking and to realise that music is both put together. Okay, thanks. Anka, can I see any other hands of people who wanted to come in before we... Um, Anka, battle um, in print. So universality again. Um, of course the question of availability. Um, I think of course, it's, music is available, but it's not only a question of geography, it's also a question of judgment. And I was wondering, you quoted ABBA and Britney Spears, and on the other hand, we had Wagner. I'm not saying the classical canon is better than any other canons, but my question is, is there a way to distinguish and to see that there is a difference in terms of quality between Britney Spears and ABBA, although I love ABBA you know, as a form of entertainment, and on the other hand, the Beatles, you know, Penny Lane or, or Wagner. And do you think that you need a certain, a certain form of education, whether it's conservatoire or um, you know, uh, music academy or just you know, practicing at home? And is judgment universal? Uh, or is it something you have to, to gain, to acquire through a painful, um, uh, a painful education in some way because you have to spend hours and hours uh, training or just trying to understand the aesthetics? So what about education and judgment? Okay, thanks. Um, I, I, this is Anka Dimitrescu who wrote the Battle and Print essay to accompany this session. That's on the website. Um, I know Karen wants to come in. Are there any other final comments before I bring back the panel? Okay. Cara. I just go back to the idea of world music, which came up quite a lot earlier on. Um, and we heard some idea, some kind of ways of listening that were kind of bad or wet, too Western, too colonial or whatever. So I just wanted to ask the panel, how do you think we should kind of, how should we listen to world music in a kind of respective, proper way? Okay, thanks for that. I'm going to let the panel sum up, or not sum up, um, but say what they would like to say for a, for a final two minutes each. Um, obviously, we're not going to um, solve the problem. We never do at the Battle of Ideas, but that's why we keep having another one. Um, <laughs> before I, I bring them in, um, just a few things to say. I mean, thanks again to, to the Royal College of Music and Society of Promotion of New Music. The, the SPNM listening posts are out there, so you can listen to those after the um, uh, session, and they'll be um, available um, throughout the day. Um, they, they contain. Um, I haven't listened to them yet, so I'm, um, but they, they, they specifically contain music which has been commissioned in response to these sessions. And the one we have for, um, for this session is by Simon Caton. Is it Simon who spoke? Yes. Um, so do, do go and have a, have a look at that and listen to those. Um, the remaining sessions um, in the Battle for Music are um, Turn That Racket Off, um, which is the, the next one after lunch, which is looking at the, the whether we should appreciate silence more, the idea of music as noise, music as a weapon, and so on. Um, so that should be interesting. And then finally, Teach the World to Sing, which is about um, uh, music education, and particularly the Music Manifesto, the government's pro project to involve um, more young people in singing. We also have tomorrow um, a session on, on, um, as part of the Arts and Society strand on whether music means anything. Um, and Colin Lawson, who's the director of the, the Royal College of Music, is going to perform um, a short piece of music, um, uh, Le Febre. Um, from the French Revolutionary period, um, and then we're going to talk about how revolutionary has made people feel, um, or something more sophisticated than that. <laughs> anyway, so, so please do um, stick around and, and come to those. So, um, perhaps just in the order that you originally spoke, uh, Ivan, you? Yeah. Two minutes. People have talked about the number of tensions that have shown themselves in this debate, and one that occurs to me is that there seems to be two ways of identifying value in music. One is to focus on the moment, you know, the, the sublime or thrilling moment. And the, the, I think this is very much Barb's um, uh, sort of motif at, uh, during the morning. We've heard, you know, these, these wonderful things which I, which I, I sort of uh, resonate with and wish I'd been there, you know, to hear or see some of these things. Um, the other way to find what's valuable in music is, is 
is what persists through time, what endures through time. And we've heard other stories about um, uh, people who have a certain passion for music and who want to assert the values of the, the musical form that they espouse. And that, of course, requires years of acculturation years of amassing that enormous CD collection, years of listening to, going to gigs, so that you then become an authoritative voice. And, um, and I, I always think it's healthy to end with a bit of disagreement on these things. And, and I, I put my, as it were, I put my cards with, with that way of judging value. I think the, tr the trouble with putting your faith in the momentary uh, experience is that what, what looks like a bright vision can turn out to be a hallucination. You know, you're in the middle of the desert, you think there's a well and, a, and an oasis in front of you. You walk towards it, it vanishes. It's not really there. And I, I've had experience, musical experiences in my past which have turned out to be mirages. They've turned out to be hallucinations. At the time, I thought they were great, but they led nowhere. Uh, years ago, I went to hear a wonderful thing called Le Mystère des Voix Bulgares. Do you anybody remember that? The Mystery yeah. of the Bulgarian Voices. And I thought, this is the most sublime thing I've ever heard. I bought the CD. I put it away. I, and the other day I was having a clear out and I found it. And it was really embarrassing because I thought, it, this obviously meant nothing to me. Because it just went into the cupboard. I probably listened to it twice. And then it went away. You know, these, these, this row of uh, mystical looking Slavic ladies with their headscarves. And I thought, this is it. I'm in touch with the tap root of music. And I wasn't. It was rubbish. I wasn't in touch with anything. You know, it, it just went away. And I think the tr momentary experiences can be like that if you're not careful. So I, I put my faith in the long durée, you know, what, what's, what keeps going? What, 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 what is it that weaves its way into your life? That's what's valuable. Thank you. John. Um, I, I, yes, well, I, why did you get into that? That's what's interesting, isn't it? I mean, but I remember at the time there was a sort of groundswell of, well, it, it was a bit Emperor's New Closing at the time, wasn't it? Um, so that's interesting. I think that things do change. I mean. I used to live in a house years ago where everyone who walked through the door, we used to get them to write down their top 10 albums and stick them on the wall. And a guy came in and he was a huge, one of my oldest friends, he was a huge Dylan fan, and practically all his top 10 were Dylan albums. And then two years later he came back and he, everything he wrote down was dub reggae. Now, to this day, I know he never plays dub reggae anymore, but at that time in his life, it was what he liked, but now he's gone back to what endures um, with Dylan, I suppose, and I think my <laughs> beliefs of things like that as well, those records that I keep finding and rediscovering. Um, I don't think people need to be taught. I think they just know what they like. And the point about, I'm sorry, but that's the way I think about it. The education point that you made, um, it's, it's interesting, the internet is a big dichotomy because A, it's not available everywhere. It drives me mad when, well, particularly my uh, the BBC go, oh, it's on our website. 45% of these people in this country do not have access to the internet easily. It's crazy. We're just, but at the same time, I'm proposing that the internet is, is something where the dissemination of music is, is uh, available. But of course, in many countries, you just can't get onto it. Um, the, the other strange thing is that I'm at the, when I was at the BPI, more people, there's never been more people making records. Yeah. That's what's changed. It's cheaper, it's easier. You can make an album for a thousand quid, easily, less. You never really tackled your point at the very back of the room. I, th I think that what I was trying to say is you can't make a moral judgment about the level to which appre people appreciate music. And I think it's a richness that people appreciate music on all sorts of levels, the highly technical level, the highly analytical level, or the purely sensual and emotional level. That, that all fits together. And, and the final point, I think, he's, I think he's gone now, but the man who was objecting to using music as a tool of social policy. If anybody had come this summer and seen the youth orchestra that came from Venezuela to the proms, where for the last 25 years, the last couple of generations, music has been used as an instrument of social policy to get kids off the streets and playing at an incredible level of sophistication. Uh, that really showed that you can, um, that music can bring people together to unlock skills that they never realized that they had and really communicate to an audience in a way that was totally active participation as, as well as just listening. It was a very, very uh, seminal moment.
Okay, thanks for the whole panel. Thank you. Thank you.